All right, let's turn to Ecclesiastes. Um, should be right after Proverbs chapter 7 and 8. Let me give you a, a, a little quick review about Solomon before we continue on. You can read uh, one of his sins in 1 Kings chapter 11. So do that as homework. And one of his sins was that he had unlawful marriages. <clears throat> it says that King Solomon loved many foreign women. Kings. He loved many foreign women. Now, it, interesting because <clears throat> whether you're rich or you're poor, you can love many women. Or at least from the perspective of humanity, worldliness, the natural, the flesh. You can love many women or love many men. But in his case, he loved many women. And his riches helped him to have many women. As many as he wanted from as, as the Bible says, from the daughters of Pharaoh, the Moabites, Amorites, Emorites, Sodomites, Hittites, from all the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them. So there's a clear commandment that God says you're not to intermarry with all these other nations. Don't be unequally yoked, Paul said. In fact, it's a New Testament teaching. It takes it from the Old Testament that we're not to be unequally yoked as believers if you are a believer in Christ Jesus, you're not to yoke yourself up with a non-believer. That is the world. And you can say they're Hittites, Amorites, Jebusites, whatever. You know, If they're non-believers, you're not to marry them. You are to marry believers, uh, men or women that have the same faith as you do and are just as strong as you are, or if not, more committed to the Lord than you are. Otherwise, you're headed down the wrong path path as Solomon was. So he's an example of not listening to the Lord. And he married all of these women from, from different nations, with different backgrounds and different beliefs. So you can imagine him coming home to all of these women and, and all the direction, all the insight that he's getting from them. So it could have brought about confusion to him. Why did he marry so many? Uh, you know, it doesn't say. Was it for sexual desires? It doesn't say. Was it for companionship? It doesn't say. It just says that he married them. I'm sure that everything that I just mentioned is probably included in that, but it doesn't really tell us why he married them. He had the resources and money to do so, and when you have resources and you have money, sometimes it allows you to participate in sin, doesn't it? Because you have the resources to go out and buy the things that, that we shouldn't be buying or to go to the places that we shouldn't be going to. But not necessarily because you're rich, but because there's that flesh desire, that hunger. Because even the poor will steal what they need to to get what they want in the flesh. And so it's not necessarily a, a rich or a poor thing. It's a fleshly thing. But having money just gives you the the resources to go ahead and get it a lot easier than someone who doesn't have the resources. You know, you look at Hollywood and, and you see that all over the place. You know, they have so much money, they don't know what to do with it. And so they're having all these types of relationships with uh, women or with men and marrying. And, and the latest craze thing uh, today is, I don't know what they call it, cougar, where older women are marrying younger Younger men, J Lo, who's what forty something, is married, or is dating a twenty-six year old. You know that type of thing because money allows you to do that. You know, and so Solomon's sin here was that he married a lot of foreign women, which was his demise. He had to listen to their culture, to their beliefs, and then decide whether uh, there was something to take advantage of or or to live by and then try to separate his belief and his culture from those things. I'll tell you what happens in those instances. That when you stay away from the Word of God, and Solomon is one that knew the Word of God. He wrote the whole book of Proverbs, right? And had a lot of wisdom there. Yet he didn't seem to apply it. But when you stay away from the Word of God, when you're not reading the Word of God, it literally, you know, one week without the Word makes you weak. 
you forget what it says or you throw it to the side. And next thing you know is you're making decisions in your own mind with your own thoughts, uh, what you're hearing on TV, what your friends are saying to you, what they're tell- how they're telling you to live, how they're telling you to party, you know, and to jo- enjoy life instead of letting the Word of God tell you that. And it's so easy. I find myself thinking sometimes, just missing one day, I find myself thinking about things and decisions and I'm trying to make these decisions and they're based upon what I'm feeling or what I've heard instead of it them being based upon the word of God. And I tell you what, it is a hard life to live when you're not basing your decisions on the word of God. And we see it in Solomon. We, we see the confusion in his life right now. If you're confused, it's because you're not in the word of God and you're not obeying the word of God. You're not listening to the Word of God. And we really need to get back to the Word of God. So that was his sin. And so he's coming from the perspective of of all of this worldly wisdom and idolatry. And he's trying to understand what life is all about. So, so in these next two chapters, he gives us just a, a horde of, of Proverbs, just as he did in the book of Proverbs. And so they're not really tied in too much to one another, like in the book of Proverbs. They're just Proverbs that come out. Some of them are good Proverbs and some of them are worldly Proverbs from the worldly perspective. And so you see them wishy-washy back and forth and reminds us of what? Romans chapter 7, right? You know, like Paul said, you know, that flesh nature is still in us and it's always there, you know, and, and it pops up any time when a situation occurs. And you get angry right away and like, oh, I'm not supposed to get angry. I'm supposed to, you know, just trust in the Lord. OK, Lord, I'm sorry that flesh just wants to rear its ugly head, you know. And Paul said that old man is there and it's with us and we know that we're supposed to crucify it. But for some reason, we don't crucify it. We, we allow him to live. And yet we know what to do. And doing good, and yet we find ourselves we don't do that good. And so it's that struggle of that nature. And of course you hear uh, many say that it depends on which one you feed the most. If you feed the flesh the most, then guess what? The flesh will, will be superior. If you feed the spirit the most, then the spirit will be superior. I know myself, and I know that I feed on the spiritual a lot, and yet I still struggle. And so I can only imagine on someone who doesn't read their word. Who's not in church on Sundays and Wednesdays and men's breakfasts or women's studies and other, you know, ministries that are out there to encourage us. I know I've heard it even in this church. I need to be in the things of God all the time because just one day and you can fall that quick and that easy. Temptation is always there. We were at um, downtown Riverside and we were witnessing and we were sharing with this young lady and she was all packed, ready to go somewhere. I can't remember where it was. I think she was leaving the area. And so we were ministering to her and we were sitting down at a table with her. And this is how sly the enemy is and how quick he, he wants to cause you to stumble. And so we're sitting there and we're witnessing to her. We got tracks out and talking about the whole road of uh, Romans, road of salvation and so forth. And underneath the table, all of a sudden I feel a foot. And she literally takes her foot and she's rubbing my leg with her foot. And I immediately just step back and said, hey, we're not here for that. You know, and then we just kind of stopped and said, this is why you need the Lord. And we were sharing it. But that's how cunning he is. That's how quick he is. Just a matter of seconds. And he can just turn you one way or the other. I mean, if you were a man maybe like Solomon, who knows? That might have been something that you might have liked, you know, and you could have easily just continued on while she was rubbing your leg, you know, there and, and pretend to be spiritual and holy in front of the other guys there, you know, and so forth. You never know. You never know. That's why we have to be in the word of God constantly, because those temptations are always there. And you know what I'm talking about, because you're tempted every single day. The enemy doesn't stop. He's always around to tempt us. So let's look at some of these practical Uh, Proverbs of wisdom. He says in verse 1 of chapter 7, a good name is better than precious ointment. And so having a good name, being an honest person, uh, though someone can smell pretty good, um, put on the perfume, put on the ointment, you know, and you come up and like, oh, they smell like, uh, I don't know, cactus, you know, something like olive oil, I don't know. Back when we were kids, there used to be this uh, woman's perfume called Babe. 
and, and I loved it when Virginia put it on. I loved the smell and the scent of it. Years later, we found a bunch of it. I bought it all. And I said, give it all to me because they didn't make it anymore, you know. And I just asked her the other day, hey, where's that, that uh, perfume that you used to wear, babe? She goes, I think it's kind of old now, <laughs> you know. I go, I don't think so, babe. <laughs> but even though perfume smells good, you know, so there's something better than that. And that's a person's name, a good name, his character, you know, is much more important than what he's wearing or how he smells. You look at the United States, you look at the presidency, not a real good name. What's associated with the presidency, not just with Obama, but Clinton and, and the scandals that went with that. You know, and you kind of have to wonder, you know, do we trust these people? I mean, they can't live morally. And a lot of people decide, well, we're not really here to judge them morally. They can do what they want privately as long as they run this country. Well, if they do that privately, guess what? They're not going to run this country, honestly, because they don't have a good name. And so there's something about a good name. That's good to have, Solomon says. And then he goes on and says, and the day of death, then the day of one's birth. Now, why would you say that? <laughs> what an interesting thing. The day of one's death and one's birth. And again, from his perspective, imagine living through life and all its struggles. I don't believe in reincarnation, but if all of a sudden you thought to yourself, if I, would I go back and do this again? No, I wouldn't. That's what he's thinking. No, it's better to just be dead and not have to deal with life anymore and get it over with. You know, and some people think that way. And that's how Solomon was thinking. It's better to be dead than to go back to that day of birth when one was born. Better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men. And the living will take it to heart. So it's better to go to the funeral than to a barbecue. Again, why? Because you're faced with death, with reality, that all of us die and we have to face our own mortality. Then to go to a barbecue and just eat and not think about life itself and the meaning of life and so forth and just exist for what? For a meaningless life? No, we need to think about morality. So it goes on, sorrow is better than laughter. For by a sad continence, the heart is made better. Uh, as much as we may not like it, our spiritual growth is done very often in the low parts of our life. That's where we're tested. When we are struggling with pain and sorrow. It, it really tests us to see if what we believe is what we believe. And so it's good to live in sorrow at times because it strengthens our faith because we realize how weak our faith is and how much more we need to trust in God. Uh, a lot of people come to the Lord when they're weak because they have nowhere else to go. And so they come to God because they know God has all the, the answers. And hopefully they stay. And once God sets them back on solid ground, they have a good foundation and they're prospering and, and life is getting better, then hopefully they realize it's because of God, because He's good. And then they, they stick with him. But that's really where we grow, is through our trials. Now, if we go through trials and we fail, then it just shows that we're weak in those areas. And we need to come back and we need to strengthen ourselves in those areas. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools in the house of myrrh. Again, I think the same idea, the sorrows, the mourning... Instead of the myrrh, which is anointment, perfume of so, some sort, uh, where your heart is there instead of learning through your situations. It is better to hear the rebuke of a wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. Now, this is interesting because this is so hard and I've seen it, uh, not just in myself, but in many others that and he's right here. It, it is better to hear a rebuke from a wise person. If someone rebukes you, at least they have enough love to share with you where you're erring, where you're struggling, what they see. And it's only because they love you. Now, obviously, there's some that share with you because they don't like you. They want to, you know, trip you up or whatever. Or they just trying to, you know, mess with you. 
You know, we got to understand that. And so we just take what they say with a grain of salt. And if it's true, then we learn from it. But if it's not, then we say thank you and we move on from there. But it's good to be rebuked. It's better than someone coming to you and just always playing their little fiddle, you know, and you're so great, everything's so wonderful. And the whole time they're lying to you and they're seeing you go down a path that's going to lead to destruction. That's not good. Chances are, though, if you're on the giving end, that you'll not be liked. And more often than not, you will not be liked if you begin to correct or rebuke somebody and trying to make them wiser. So just a word of caution that happens and you really have to approach it very wisely and lovingly. For like the crackling of thorns under a pot. So you get this idea of a campfire, a pot's there and you, they throw thorns which just burn up right away. You know, and it crackles and pops all over. So is the laughter of a fool. This is also vanity. So it burns up real quick. There's no lasting um, joy whatsoever. It's just vain and sinful. Surely oppression destroys a wise man's reason. And a bribe debases the heart. Now, interesting here. Why would he say oppression destroys a wise man's reason? He has all these wives. Uh, there's another sin that he also got involved with, and God said, do not have many horses. And, of course, he got into a lot of horses, and we'll talk more about that later on. But he got into all this sin, and I am sure that he got oppressed. We know what oppressed means, right? It's when life just gets on you, and you think about everything. Think about some of you that, that remember the teenage years. Uh, some of you that are teenagers, you know, uh, how... Life can seem oppressive to you. As a teenager, you know, you have school. And you have so many classes. And you have to keep your grade up. And then you have sports. And you've got to do good in sports. And then you have friends that you're trying to please because of peer pressure. And then you have your mom. And then you have your dad. And then you have your brothers and your sisters. And all of this at once. And then someone's trying to correct you. And another one's trying to tell you what to do. And you're taking all this. And you're just like, you know what? Shut up. You know, I'm just, I, I can't take this. And that's why they freak out so much. And you remember that being a kid, how, how the pressure just gets to you. Imagine having a hundred wives, a <laughs> hundred wives and come over here. No, come over here. No, I cooked you over here. No, I can't cook this here. You know, and, and then to run this great kingdom, you know, and people coming to you for wisdom and having all of this money and, and, you know, just the pressure of it all. Why do they like me? Is it my money or is it me? You know, so. So just having this oppression can really cause you to be in confusion. And really what you need to do is just say, Lord, just take this stuff from me. I'm just going to lay it at your feet and I'm going to leave it there. And I'm going to live one day at a time according to your word. I mean, you literally have to do that because it can be too much. I mean, there are times it's hard to explain as a pastor you know, you're responsible for so many lives and, and sharing the truth. And then yet some like you and some don't like you. And then you have various ministries that you have to oversee and make sure things are going on. Then you have to communicate and then some don't like to communicate, you know, and then you have to make sure the administration. I mean, just a lot of stuff going on and, and it can really cause you to feel the pressure if you don't just let it go. You know, and say, Lord, this is not my ministry. It's your ministry. You know, and I've done that for so many years where I tried to control everything so that everything runs smoothly. And I just realized I can't. It just causes too much uh, oppression. You know, it's too much stress. And so you just have to say, Lord, this is your ministry. And so oftentimes, you know, Mariana will come and say, oh, no, 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 just take care of it. <laughs> you know, It's like, whatever, you know, let's try to work it out, like get it done and just move on, you know, not, not think about it too much. Deal with this situation. If it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, then move on. Just keep going because you can get stuck like in a rut, you know, a hole and your wheels there and you're just spinning and spinning and spinning and you're, and, and you're hitting that gas pedal as hard as you can. and You're not going anywhere. You know, you're just not going to go anywhere. And you need to really just give it to the Lord and let Him do the work. It can really confuse the, the wisdom that you have if you're oppressed. Don't ever make decisions when you're oppressed, when you're stressed out. Just, just take time to go away and pray, calm down, and then make your decisions. 
Otherwise, you lose a lot of wisdom there. The end of a thing is better than the beginning or its beginning. The, the patience in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. So again, that same idea. <clears throat> Always at the end, because then you're done with it all. I mean, that, that's our life. That was the Thessalonians, right? When's the Lord coming so we can get out of here? You know, and that's us too, right? Lord, when are you coming so we can get out of this world? Because we're not of this world. We're not a part of this world. And this world keeps enticing us and draws us in and... Possibly we will fall away and be crushed under that rock, you know, but our hope is in Jesus. And so we're looking for his soon return. And so we're always asking, Lord, when's the end? When's the end? And and we look around us and we see the end is coming really close. You know, China right now owns us. (laughs) They basically own us and they can they can cripple us very easily if they call in a lot of the debt that we owe them, not just China. But then um, you have Russia who's gaining power and strength. And they're not a part of the UN. And they're uh, really upset that other parts of Russia want to become a part of the UN. And they're saying, no, we're not going to be a part of the UN and so forth. And so we see a lot of those things. Now the same-sex marriage thing. And now a judge, I can't remember exactly where it was, but in another state, just pretty much uh, made a judgment saying that he cannot make it illegal for a man to marry two women or a woman to marry two men because that was brought before him. He said, nope, it's not illegal. In light of what happened with the same-sex marriage, I'm not going to say that that's illegal. So now it's legal now for you to marry uh, two individuals. I mean, it's just getting worse and worse. It's just amazing. And so we see the end coming. Just need to keep our heads up high and trust in the Lord. Do not hasten in your spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. You know, the Bible tells us, Solomon said in Proverbs, you know, anger doesn't produce the righteousness of God. And so we need to keep our anger down. Um, Again, another thing we need to make sure is, is taken care of before we make decisions is our anger. Don't make decisions when you're angry. Because you just go way out there. It's like, you, you say those things like, you're always doing that. Really? I'm always doing that? No, but you're being extreme because you're angry. You never tell me you love me. Really? I've never said that ever? Well, it just feels like it right now because I'm mad and I'm letting you know I'm mad. You know, and you, you can't react when you're angry. Though it's hard and difficult. It just brings about wrath. Verse 10, do not say, why were the former days better than these? For you do not inquire wisely concerning this. Um, the old days, you know. I mean, some of us that are older are like, man, I wish I was 35 again. Really? I don't wish I was 35. I wish I was 21. Really? <laughs> I don't know. You know, or, or, you know, some of the ladies, I wish we lived back in the 50s. You know, or the or the thirties or the twenties without washing machines and microwaves, really? What would you do? <laughs> what would you do then? And be out there in the rocks in the river <laughs> washing clothes? You know, it's like forget it. Those are the old days. We need to look forward to the new days and don't live back there. It's not wise to live back there. Wisdom is good with an inheritance and profitable to those who see the sun. For wisdom is a defense, as money is a defense. But the excellence of knowledge is that wisdom gives life to those who have it. So when it comes to wisdom and money, wisdom is more profitable than money. Money can only last so long. It only lasts here. But wisdom will take you uh, beyond eternity. Solomon said in Proverbs 16, 16, how much better to get wisdom than gold. So it's better to have wisdom than it is to go to have gold. And of course, look at Solomon where he's at because of his choices and his decisions to live in the culture, to live in the world, to do the things that they're doing. And it was the demise of his own kingdom as it would be the demise of our own households. And I've seen I've seen household Christian households who who loved the Lord and were serving the Lord. And then all of a sudden, and it doesn't happen just like that, where, where the, the male, the man, all of a sudden tells the wife, I don't love you anymore. 
and I'm calling it quits. I'm divor- I'm divorcing you. You know, like where did that come from? Well, it's been happening for a while because he's been seeing someone else on the side for quite a long time. He's been in the world. He's been going out to little, you know, what do they call those things after work? Drinks after hours, you know, that type of thing. You know that. <laughs> you know, and so he's hanging around there and doing worldly things. And now his whole family is destroyed. And not just his wife, but his kids. Because his kids are watching. And they're like, why would dad do that? Was it my fault? You know? And then all these questions come up and it just destroys the whole family. And it's sad, all because one person wants to live in the world. And it shouldn't be. Consider the work of God. For who can make straight what he has made crooked? I mean, only God can do that, right? And of course, Jesus is God. Uh, You can't straighten out your life. You can't make things that are crooked straight. Only God can do something like that. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider. Surely God has appointed the one as well as the other. So that man can find out nothing that will come after him. Now, this is speaking of the sovereignty of God, right? Right? I mean, if you're rich, then yeah, you're going to be happy. You're going to be joyful. You have enough resources. But what about when you don't? Are you just as happy? Same God. Sits on the same throne. Doing the same work. The perspective has to be that God is in control. He's sovereign. The word sovereignty means his will will be done. Because he's God. And he sits upon the throne. Accepting the will of God in our lives. That, my friend, is strength. And and that is power. Over sin and over temptation. When you know that God is in control of your life. And that he has you right where he wants you. And you can trust and have faith in him. Even though the whole world around you is, is in chaos. is falling apart. You can be at peace and at rest because you know God is sovereign and that he has things in total control. It's a good place to be, to know that the will of the Lord will always prevail. I have seen everything in my days of vanity. There is a just man who perishes in his righteousness and there is a wicked man who prolongs life in his wickedness. Now, there's a human perspective there. It just seems unfair, right? How many of you have seen... You know, wicked men prosper. Oh, yeah, all the time. And yet, good men die young, you know, without nothing. Judgment's coming for the wicked. We have a different perspective than Solomon does. He doesn't have the full gospel available to him like we do. The New Testament teaching and that perspective. Though he knows God and has the wisdom, yet he doesn't know the plan of God. And how it's to unveil through Jesus Christ in the end times. And so when he sees the wicked, he doesn't understand the judgment of God that's coming upon the wicked. And it's coming, and we do, right? We know that when men do harm to us, we know judgment's coming. We don't have to judge them. We just can love them or accept them, you know, and know that one day God and, and them will meet face to face. And God will take care of what truth is in reality. And and that brings you, again, strength and power because you can leave it in God's hands because he's in control. So even when you see the wicked prospering, just know they're going to stand before God. It's sad. It's sad that they don't see it. And in fact, it makes you feel sorry for them because they can be a real wicked person, a wicked individual, whether at work or someone you may know. And they're doing wicked things and you're getting upset and angry and mad. But in reality, they're going to hell. They'd be damned. And one day, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years from now, they'll stand before God. And all those things they did, they'll be accountable for and be sent to hell. I mean, that's sad. And we should have pity on them more more than anger and frustration with them. And yet, then you see somebody who dedicates their life to the Lord And it seems like their life is cut short. Jesus was 33 years old. But we know that God's sovereign. And there was a plan in the life of Jesus Christ. And so, even with the righteous, there's a plan that God has, even in their death. And so, Solomon says, I've seen it. The poor die young. The rich 
seem to live on to eternity and prosper. Do not be overly righteous. Uh, I love this because he has a total humanistic perspective here in these two verses. Do not be overly righteous, nor be overly wise. Why should you, why should you destroy yourself? Do not be overly wicked, nor be foolish. Why should you die before your time? Do you know what he's saying here? <clears throat> It's like Christians who say, well, why do we have to go to church every Sunday? Don't go to church every Sunday. Go enjoy the world, too. Go to, go to church functions, but you can go to the party and bars, too. And so you can have a little bit of this and have a little bit of that. And you cover both sides and you'll be happy. That's what he's saying here. Is that true? Because God's called us to be holy, sanctified, separated from the world, right? Set apart for God. And so his perspective here is wrong. Why is it wrong? Because he has these women, these with, you know, and they're saying, well, come over here. Come and worship my God. And so he's like, well, do a little wicked and then do a little good. Almost almost like if the Jews today, you know, they they hope every year when it comes to Passover, they can't offer up a a, a lamb as a sacrifice because they don't have sacrifice anymore. So what they do is they weigh their good deeds and their bad deeds. And so they look at their lives and they see, okay, how many good deeds have I done? And do they outweigh the bad deeds that I've done? And so if they've done greater good deeds, then they feel better about themselves. But in reality, the Bible says that if you violate one law, you violated the whole law. You're you're guilty of it all if you don't keep it all. And so... You can't do that. Jesus says you're separate. You're not to sin. In fact, you're not to continue to sin. You're to separate yourself from this world. That's a, a totally, totally world view. And really, it's a self-righteous view. Because I'm all right because I do a little righteous. And it's okay to do a little wickedness too. I will trust in God. I'll work hard. But I'll buy a lottery ticket because it's six point three five million dollars. You know, and luck might just come my way. There's no such thing as luck. I don't like it when Christians say that. Good luck. It's luck. No, is God in control or is luck in control? God's in control, not luck. Chance? Not chance. God is sovereign. God is in control of everything. There is no luck. There's God and there's Satan. You want to call luck? That's Satan. That's chance. And he'll give you a chance. He'll give you prosperity. He'll he'll give you what you want if he'll keep you away from God. Where God doesn't. God wants you all for himself. He's sovereign. But that's how we are. A little evil, a little righteous, you know. And and that's really self-righteousness and... And that's destructive. In fact, Proverbs 16.2 says, All the ways of man are pure in his own eyes. But the Lord weighs the Spirit. The Lord weighs the Spirit. It is good that you grasp this and also not remove your hand from the other. For he who fears God will escape them all. So instead of being self-righteous, as he said earlier, look to the Lord. Trust in the Lord. He's the only one that can forgive you of your sins. And He's the only one that can impute to you righteousness. No one else. Because your self-righteousness, doing a little good, doesn't make you good. Wisdom strengthens the wise more than ten rulers of the city. For there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. That's true. Paul said, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So there are none righteous, no, not one. So he's right there. Also, do not take to heart everything people say. At least you hear your servant cursing you. So don't take to heart when people say things about you. Oftentimes you say things about other people. So don't get upset. Take it with a grain of salt. Forget it. Sometimes people... Right to my face will say stuff. I'm like, oh, okay. (laughs) And I just move on. Just move on. It's not worth it. You know? Um, I used to always tell the boys when they were growing up, 
And they would get in trouble. And they're like, why am I getting in trouble? I says, you know what? I'm, I'm your dad. And I only can see so much. And I don't get it right all the time. So, so if you got a spanking or you're punished, it's probably for something that I don't even know you did. And God's getting you now. <laughs> so, so don't worry about it, you know. Just know that you can't get away with things because God will find out. Yeah, I'm probably wrong with this one. And you're telling me I'm wrong? Then maybe I'm wrong. But he got you for something else. I'm sure there's something else that you thought you got away with. You know, so when people talk about you, when they're saying things, just forget it. Don't worry about it because you're probably talking about someone else, too. You know, you're probably saying things about other people, too. I mean, even as a pastor, you know, oh, that pastor, I don't know about that guy. You know, and I'm like, oh, there I am, you know. <laughs> I mean, we all do it. And that's why we take it with a grain of salt. Our flesh. For many times, also, your own heart has known that even you have cursed others, he says in verse 22. All this I have proved by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. Oh, boy, you ever get those times like, yeah, I'm going to really be wise today. I'm really going to do it. And then all of a sudden it's like, man, where did it go? I'm like, how did I miss it? As for that which is far off and exceedingly deep, who can find it out? I applied my heart to know, to search, and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things, to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. I mean, he searched it out every which way he could, had the resources, had the time. You know, what do they say? Uh, idle time is the devil's workshop. You know, and when you're idle and you're not doing anything, that's when you get into trouble. And so he got into a lot of trouble because he sought out everything. I mean, this man sought out pleasure. He sought out education. He sought out philosophies. He sought it all out to the extreme. You know, to the extreme and found out that it was vanity. And I find more bitter than than death, the woman whose heart is snared, is snares and nets. Now, now he's talking about his wives, whose hands are uh, feathers. He who pleases God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be trapped by her. He talks about this in in uh, Proverbs too, about that seductive woman. You know, watch out for her, guys. Watch out for those women that are seductive. You know, that only want one thing. <clears throat> it's a warning. And he saw that and he saw it was a trap. And it's something that we need to be careful of. Here is what I have found, says the preacher. Adding one thing to another to find out the reason. Which my soul still seeks, out, seeks but I cannot find. One man among a thousand I have found. But a woman among all these I have not found. So Solomon is basically saying that there are a few men who are wise. And yet not many women that are or wise. Again, he's looking at his wives. Now, is that true? No. Because you know, the Bible tells us that God gives wisdom. He's not, you know, partiality to men or women. You know, we have that same ability and so forth. Women come up with some great ideas. You know, my wife's a lot smarter than me. She's always correcting me, especially in my vocabulary. You know, there's wisdom there. And you need to listen to your wives and hear what they're saying. And then as the head of your home, you make those decisions. You know. uh, Solomon is listening to all of these concubines and he's saying, man, none of them have any wisdom at all. Well, obviously, because he's got God's wisdom on his side. And so from his perspective, none of them are wise at all. You can't think that way as a man. Um, God created woman to be your helpmate, to come alongside you. She's equal to you in the eyes of God. She's not less than you, but she is your helpmate. And she's a child of God. She's a sister in the Lord. And you need to love her, respect her, and take care of her with everything that you have. Now let's go to chapter 8 to finish up. It's a shorter chapter. Who's like a wise man and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine and the sternness of his face to change. So it's only a person who comes to know the Lord that radiates the love of God. It's the only way that you can have true wisdom. The world wisdom is worldliness and only gets you into trouble. But true wisdom is the fear of the Lord and understanding his word. I say keep the king's commandment for the sake of your oath to God. Now that's interesting. 
And we see this in Peter when we were, when we were going through it about governments and so forth. And we're going to be seeing it probably next year when we get into it. Because the next two weeks we'll be talking about Christmas and New Year's Eve. How we're to submit to the ordinances of the land. And then Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10 the same thing. And in light of what's going on in our country today, we have a lot of Christians that are getting a little rebellious towards our country. And we need to be careful with that. We're to, we're to follow the laws of the land. The United States, the United States is based upon the word of God because of our forefathers. We've fallen away from that, but there are things that we do that necessarily we don't have to do. Now, let's just take taxes for instance. You know, that's a big thing with us is taxes. We get taxed out of our pockets, you know, just constantly, and we hate taxes, and we'll vote against taxes and so forth. You know, but yet. Is it against God's word to pay taxes? No. Jesus even told Peter, go get some coins to pay your tax. Give to Caesar's with Caesar's. Give to God's with God's. And so for us to rebel and take up arms and say this is a wicked, evil government because it takes our taxes, it's not biblical. We live in the United States. This is the way it is. So we have to trust God with what we have and our resources. And we need to pay our taxes. We can't rebel. Now, there was a guy. I'm not going to mention his name. You probably know him. But he wasn't paying taxes. He never paid taxes. Had a ministry the whole bit. And said, it, said that the Bible taught that we're not to pay taxes. We're not to be ruled by any other government but God's government and so forth. Well, he's in jail. He's in jail. They took him and they got him for tax evasion. And they took everything away from him. You know, and that's where he's at. And he's ministering in there and taking the opportunity to share the gospel. But the Bible doesn't say we shouldn't pay taxes. You know? Now, I know you might not like that. And I'm, I apologize. I'm not trying to make you angry. You know, but you just you have to pay your taxes. Well, at what percent? 10 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent, 40 percent doesn't say you know, what happens is you pay more taxes and eventually people get angry enough, their wages go up and it just kind of keeps going. I wish somebody would come along and just say, let's cut everything in half. <laughs> you know, taxes in half, wages in half, and now we're down here and let's start over again. Someone's going to do that eventually. Like the flat rate tax, remember how that was talked about for a while? Something like that. But, you know, things like that that are happening in our country today. Now, yeah, abortion. If they're telling you us as a church, that we're to pay into abortion, then no, because God is against killing babies. And we don't do that. That's totally different. And that's in any nation. Whether you offer up to Moloch, some idol, or whether you're a third world country, you do not kill babies. You just don't do that. But taxes is, is something totally different. Pledge allegiance, if they decide to get rid of, get rid of the flag... The United States just says, you know what, we're not going to pledge allegiance anymore. We're not going to have a flag anymore. Okay, a lot of people will be upset, but there's no where in Scripture you find that we're to pledge to the allegiance of some flag. You know, we, ha we have to understand that, you know, we live in a great country, but a lot of the things that we're rebelling against, God necessarily is not telling us to rebel against. You know, owning guns, that's a big thing right now, you know, is owning guns. We have a right to bear arms and we do. The Bible even says, pick up your sword. There'll be a time to do that. But are we to rebel because they take away our guns? Is there biblical precedence on that? Do we rebel against that? No. Will they kill us? Possibly. Round us all, round us all up, take us to the camp and kill us? Yeah, maybe. So we go to heaven. And I'm waiting for that. But do we rebel? You know, I think we have to really be careful in how we represent Christ. He didn't rebel at all. And really that's our, our picture. And if I'm going to err, if I'm going to be wrong, I'd rather err on Christ's example than any other example. I'd rather let them come in and shoot me and go to heaven than me try to fight and shoot them back and kill a bunch of them, you know, and say, well, that's okay. I'm going to come to Christ because of that. I'd rather them feel guilty than me just saying, go ahead. And then let them go home thinking about how this person just said, do it. You know, and in Jesus' name, I forgive you, you know, and be an example. You know, I think that's more powerful to saving a soul than taking a gun and shooting back at him. That's my opinion for what it's worth. 
Let's move on. Do not be hastily to go from his presence. Do not take your stand for an evil thing, for he does whatever pleases him. Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say to him, what are you doing? Uh, Yeah, that one's pretty clear. They have power. He who keeps his commands will experience nothing harmful. And a wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment, because for every matter there is a time and judgment. Through the misery of man increase greatly, for he does not know what will happen. So who can tell him when it will occur? No one has power over the spirit to retain the spirit, and no one has power in the day of death. There is no release From that war. And wickedness will not deliver those who are given to it. There's only one that gives life. And that is God. He's the one that gives life. And he is the one that gives death to. Job said that, right? The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so the Lord takes our life too. Now, how does he take it? It all depends on how he wants to take it. He, he took a lot of lives during the time where Balaam caused Moab to send women down to the children of Israel and then God's judgment came upon them. And a lot of Israelites were, were killed because of that. Lord, the Lord was involved in that. The Lord took Jesus' life, the twelve apostles' life and certain ways he took their life and so he takes our life and in the last days if we're living in these last days and government decides to do something that may be the way that God chooses to do that too because the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh only God has that power to do so now what if we're on the other end what if we're in the military then you're an instrument of righteousness for freedom and God has given you in a sense, the approval to be that judgment upon someone else. And you need to trust that God is taking their life because He's the one that takes life and not you. That's, that's hard to grasp and understand because you, you know, you're shooting a gun or whatever at someone and you are taking their life, but yet at the same time it's God's taking their life. Knowing that you would do that. Knowing that the bullet... Because who's to say that the bullet could go to the one side or the other and miss them completely if God didn't want them. And how many stories have you heard of people, you know, being in situations like that and totally missing them? You know, I always find it interesting. You watch some of these war movies, you know, and they're just walking and running and bullets and like they're the ones that don't get hit. Everyone else is getting hit and you're like, how come he never gets hit? Because it's not his time. Because God's in control. You know? Hard to grasp that, though. All this I have seen and applied my heart to every work that is done under the sun. There is a time in which one man rules over another to his own heart. Um, again, God's in control, even, even, even in authority. God puts authority from the president to the Congress, the Senate in the United States. You know, The only government that doesn't change is really the church. You can live in Iran and we see it's dictatorship from Russia. You go to Israel and they have prime minister and then they have governments and so forth. But the church government never changes. It's always Jesus, the head of that church, the pastor or the bishop, you might want to call them. Then you have the elders and the deacons. And that always stays the same and has been the same since the New Testament. Solomon says God puts them in authority. Paul said the same thing in Romans. God puts them in authority. For what? For you. For the church. For righteousness. Pastors, to what? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That's why it's important to be in church. To equip you for your work. And where God is leading us as a church, where God is leading you as an individual, as He's speaking the Word, and the Word is being spoken out to you, and you can hear from Him and get direction. Then I saw the wicked burn. Who had come and gone from the place of holiness, buried, the wicked buried, who had come and gone from the place of holiness, and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This also is vanity. 
Um, this could be speaking of someone that's just kind of plain. They're religious. They're not really sincere with Christ. They're wishy-washy. They're not committed to the Lord completely. And so they're just playing around with the church. Because a sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Um, that's speaking of judicial punishment. You know, our death penalty. And we know that works. You, you leave a child alone to do whatever he wants, and guess what? He does whatever he wants. But you discipline a child, you spank a child, like Proverbs says to do, right at the seat of understanding, right at the butt. And God makes that butt really cushiony so you don't hurt them. But it hurts when you swat them. You, know, you can't break anything when you do that. It just stings. You, know. you get about and you whack them right there and it's just like, ah! And they don't want that again. And so they won't do the thing that they did to get them there. That makes sense. That's how you keep a child in line. How do you keep people in line in society? Well, there's laws. You don't run a stop sign. If you do, there's a ticket. You don't cross over the, the yellow line on the freeway. Otherwise, not only it's not it's not 270 anymore. What is it now? What do we say? 500? 400, huh? 401 if you cross the line in, in, on the freeway. $401. How many of you are going to cross that line? That's some of that's our rent, you know. Oh, that's our rent to cross that one line. So it keeps us in line, doesn't it? And if we were to do that capitally, if you commit murder or rape or something like that, and, and you just kill them, you know, not murder them, kill them, and God is judge, guess what? People will stop doing that. It makes sense. You know, it makes sense. And that's what Solomon is saying here. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged, yet I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before Him. So it's better to be poor and upright in fearing the Lord than to be rich and wicked. Good perspective to have there. But it will not be well with the wicked, nor will he prolong his days, which are as a shadow because he does not fear before the Lord. There is a vanity which occurs on earth, that there are just men to whom it happens according to the work of the wicked. Again, there are wicked men to whom it happens according to the work of the righteousness. I said that this also is vanity. So, he couldn't understand from a human perspective these things, why the wicked prospered and why the righteous suffered. just couldn't understand that. Again, we know today it's because God calls us to be poor or calls us to be rich doesn't give us that ability to make money because there's a responsibility with it but he just couldn't couldn't understand it well, Matthew 5:45 he he makes his sunrise on the evil and on the good he sends rain on the just and on the unjust so it's God it's judgment call so I command enjoyment because a man has nothing better under the sun than to eat, drink, and to be merry. For this will remain with him in his labor all the days of his life which God gave him under the sun. So in other words, it's better just to you know, live life up and party. Enjoy life because you know what? Life is bad enough. When I apply my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, even though one sees no sleep day or night, then I saw all the work of God, that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. For though a man labors to discover it, yet he will not find it. Moreover, the wise man attempts to know it, he will not be able to find it. So, we can't understand it. And we won't understand it. And we can't understand everything. Why? Isaiah 55, 8, 9, right? Because God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. They're far greater than we can imagine. And so we need to just rest and trust in God. Paul told us all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Right? And so we trust in God that he's working things out for our good, though we don't understand these things because we don't have control over them. Life 
is really confusing when you look at life. You look at the turns, the right to the left, and what God throws at you, what the world throws at you, and you're just like, what is going on here? And you can be very confused. But when you just stick with what you do know, is that Jesus died on the cross for you, that He loves you, He prepared a way for you, that you have eternal life, and you are just to trust in Him every day for His daily provision. Give us our daily bread, Lord. Give us our daily bread. Let's pray. 